Just as a way of introduction, um, the city of Johannesburg basically um, is located within the, the Gauteng province. And we all know that uh, the Gauteng province is actually one of the smallest provinces uh, in South Africa. Uh, history tells us that the province was established about 100 years ago uh, after the discovery of gold in the Bad Batas Run. Um, and that was basically due to, to the availability of water resources, which made it uh, easier uh, for the miners to, to mine gold. Um, we also know that uh, the Houghton province is quite rich in biodiversity, purely because um, the province is located between two biomes, um, the savanna and the grassland biome. And basically our grassland biome is uh, regarded as one of the two rich primary uh, grassland biomes in the world. Um, which basically occupies about 80% of the province. And as a province, we basically boast uh, quite a large number of uh, uh, taxa. We have about 2,000 species, plant species, indigenous plant species that are occurring within our province. Uh, in terms of mammals, we are looking at at least 125 species of those. Um, and also about 400 species of birds um, and 21 species of uh, amphibians and lastly, about 92 species of reptiles, which are basically found within this small province, which supports uh, the, the argument that this is also one of the highly biodiverse uh, provinces um, in the country. Um, as a province, we are also quite rich in endemism, so which means there are plants which only occurs within our province, which cannot be found elsewhere. Uh, we have about 11 taxa that are endemic to the Hawken province, but the unfortunate part is that um, um, literature also tells us that the province is actually poorly conserved. Um, we have about 2% that is uh, under protection, uh, that is with regard to the grassland uh, ecosystems. It being the smallest province uh, in the country, obviously the province suffers from um, different pressures, and one of them basically is the population growth. Um, and that comes with its own challenges, um, like for instance the demand for, for land for, for settlement um, and also the conflicting land uses that we, we come across, uh, which means there's a competition for our spaces, um, there's development pressure, there's also a need to conserve. And we've also observed that there are other pressures which are experienced by the, the city, uh, things like pollution, my colleagues have touched on that, Obviously, there are other pressures which we cannot necessarily identify, like climate change, but those are also expected to have an impact on, on, on our precious ecosystems. And indeed, um, the invasive alien species, which is actually regarded as one of the silent pressures which is impacting especially on our aquatic um, ecosystems. As mentioned earlier on, um, the invasive species uh, are basically the species which were intentionally or unintentionally introduced within, uh, I would say, within the city, because we are focusing on the city of Tobruk. And they could be plant or animals. Um, and these uh, species actually come from other countries, which means they don't bring with them uh, the natural enemies that are supposed to control their population. And therefore, because they don't have natural enemies, they then grow uh, uh, uncontrolled. Uh, which means then they outcompete our indigenous vegetation. Uh, that can also lead to some of our species uh, being driven out of our, of our ecosystems. Um, it is important to note that a plant or an animal is regarded as invasive if it occurs outside of its distribution range, or if it poses a threat to an ecosystem or another species, and also if it causes an impact on the economy or human health. Um, other than that, then, it can be regarded as an exotic species, but not invasive species. Um, and literature has shown that uh, invasive species are actually uh, impacting on every ecosystem globally, um, and urban ecosystems specifically are highly impacted by um, uh, biological invasions. Um, and these invasions are, seem to be increasing in urban areas due to migration. Um, people moving in and out of, of our cities, and especially Johannesburg, which is a sink, as it's, uh, we have one of the biggest airports, um, 
and also we are a break off bulk kind of a province because there are different transport systems that actually intertwine or crosses our, our, our city as well. Certainly these, these pressures uh, don't just act in an open, um, they find themselves uh, in catchment. And that is where basically we are operating uh, as integrated catchment. So what it means is that whatever that is happening anywhere in the catchment, due to the interlink uh, processes of either the species or the processes, it will find its way one way or the other through direct or indirect um, um, impact somewhere in either the, our rivers, uh, our wetlands, um, either our dams. And uh, if it finds itself within our dams, um, for instance, issues of water purification then becomes a problem because the city needs to uh, invest a lot of money in trying to clean those. If it finds itself within our catchments, it also adds its own challenges because uh, it's either impact on the ecological functioning of those catchments, which means then the city needs to invest money in trying to maintain those catchments. So basically what it means is that none of these activities or the pressures are acting alone. Um, they all act in an interconnected uh, um, manner, which means if we want to rectify um, or want to maintain our catchments, we can't just focus on one aspect, which is invasives. We have to look at a broader picture, uh, which also includes other activities like um, human settlement development, like uh, the application of fires, the management of erosion within, within our catchment. Not to dwell much on this because our, uh, our sister department from National have touched on, but the invasive species are uh, basically managed uh, under a, le a legal framework in the SA. And uh, we have an act called the National Environmental Management uh, Biodiversity Act, which has the invasive species regulations um, enacted in it. Um, and basically the act specifies that um, every management authority, including organs of states uh, or, or spheres of government, uh, need to prepare the management uh, plans or control plans uh, which need to be submitted uh, to the department or its bodies. And those plans need to be uh, reviewed every five years. And uh, I'm glad to, to, to report that. Uh, I am aware that um, our uh, sister department within the city is in process of finalizing this plan. It is also important to note that this, these regulations aren't only applicable to, to the spheres of government, they're also applicable to privately, privately owned lands which is something quite important because uh, within the city you are not only we are operating within spaces which are either traversing uh, private properties or there we have private properties that are neighboring uh, our properties as well. So it then requires us to work in partnership with those um, uh, other landowners. And as mentioned before, uh, these regulations categorize the species into different categories. Um, we have the 1As, which are basically those which need to be combated or er eradicated. And uh, the 1B is those which need to be controlled. And the category 2, those which require a permit for you to, to carry out a listed activity. And the category 3, which are the species which are exempted um, are from being um, uh, possessed, not unless one then acquires a, a particular permit in that regard. However, it is important to note that um, even if a plant is identified as a category three listed species, if it occurs within a riparian area, uh, for the purpose of managing those species, those plants um, automatically change their categories into category 1B, which means then they require some level of control. However, as well, there's always um, um, a careful uh, we know of the GAMS and Bees Roadmap that is applicable in SA. The GAMS and Bees Roadmap basically specifies certain regulations or exemptions with regard to the management of GAMS. For us, which are in the urban setup, um, it basically talks about the GAMS in urban areas, which are of about 400 millimeters in girth, measured at about 1,000 millimeters in height, it states that those gums are exempted from being removed. However, as I mentioned earlier on, 
um, most of the areas where we operate on are uh, on uh, along the rivers or along the riparian areas. And this regulation states that even if any of the above regulations apply on a gum tree, if it's found within the riparian area, that particular gum tree basically needs to be uh, controlled through the, uh, the approach of uh, 1A, 1B. So, which means that most of the activities that are, or most of the control activities which are going to be occurring within our riparian vegetation basically takes into control all the regulations that are applicable as 1B, uh, 1B regulations. Turning our focus onto aquatic species, um, this can be fish, which we've had uh, discussions earlier on, but our focus is mostly on plants. Um, and I don't, I don't want to explain exactly what an aquatic is because it has been explained earlier on. It, these are also species which, are, which have been introduced into our aquatic systems, and due to the lack of natural enemies, then they grow uncontrollably. They can be found falling within these categories. They can be an emergent vegetation, which means they can be found on the, on the edges of, the, of a particular water body. They can be found floating, which means uh, uh, they, they, they will basically be floating uh, within the water body. Like for instance, your, your water hyacinth falls uh, within that category. They could be algae, or they could be non-rooted uh, floating vegetation or they could be completely submerged uh, vegetation. And the reason why I've highlighted this is, whilst the, the invasive species uh, are plants, they are also indicators of a certain, uh, um, they are indicators of the quality of the system. So depending on what species is occurring in that particular system, it could be telling you that there are other impacts which are actually acting in that particular system where you are operating. So it's important as well to be able to identify the species and also to know which group it belongs in because it can be telling you something big that is happening within the, the particular uh, system. But pulling it uh, to an uh, implementation level, because we work basically at a local, um, uh, at an implementation level, our focus is mostly on the control and management. However, we do have um, uh, response um, approaches where we are required to do that, especially if there's uh, a species that is reported to either be unknown or be causing any other problems. But where the public can help us is on the prevention. Um, my colleagues have echoed on this. The prevention basically means that a species cannot either be released or uh, listed activities cannot be carried if the person does not have a permit. And of course, uh, the transportation of those species need to be combated. Because we all know that if it's then released into the natural environment, it has an ability to, to invade. Our management interventions uh, follow certain approaches. Um, they, we have an integrated approach into the way we manage our invasive species which means we apply different control methods and also we, in, um, we integrate with other partners. Um, we have an approved annual plan, which is informed by data. Uh, we also have elements of research and monitoring that we, we apply as well to, to be able to advise our operations. At times, there is an element of external funding that we, we require because we all know that our budgets could be limited at times. Um, just looking at our management and op our operational plan, uh, currently we are operating in these following properties um, in both gardens. And these are the at least three species that we are focusing on there. It's uh, Mexican water lily, the pickerel weed, and the iris, which is the yellow flame. And the interventions which are applied there is basically mechanical control. And as stated earlier on, we try by all means to avoid chemicals uh, due to uh, the sensitivity of our, of our systems. Indeed, there are areas where chemicals are required to use if they are approved. Uh, we also have activities happening in Blue Dam, uh, which is in Region F. 
Uh, and there we are dealing basically with uh, Mexican uh, water lily. However, we've also added some species in this dam, uh, which came out of, out of our uh, mapping process that we, we are busy with. And the management interventions there basically are mechanical control. We have um, activities in Florida Lake, where we are dealing with Mexican uh, water lily as well. Um, and it's safe to say that um, this activity here is quite overwhelming uh, due to the densities and I suppose it will require um, a broader uh, intervention which might involve other management interventions than the mechanical control that we are currently are busy with. We also have um, activities in Lone Hill Dam where we are dealing with the uh, Salvinia molesta, which is the cariba weed. And there we have uh, two management interventions. We have the mechanical control and biological control. We also have uh, management interventions on parrot feather through the mechanical control. And I've just been informed uh, this morning that uh, we might be getting uh, biological control for this species as well, which is um, uh, a plus. Cause it's very difficult to control as well. Uh, it should be noted that these two species are actually floating species and they multiply vegetatively, like what my colleague has explained earlier on with water hyacinth, which means uh, they, need, they require careful control, when, which basically being vegetatively productive means that every piece of the plant that remains behind can produce a live um, uh, and productive plant. And depending on the aggression of the productivity of the plant, some of these plants can produce within three weeks of them being in the water, in the water body. So um, it just explains um, how quick this can actually get out of hand. In Vet Copen Dam, um, we have the same species as in, in, in Lone Hill. We have Cariba weed and uh, Parrot Feather. And again, the management interventions there uh, mechanical control and biological control. So it's basically an integrated approach. Because we understood that just undertaking control on its own isn't going to uh, uh, help us, uh, we, we also need to be able to assess the efficacy of our activities. Hence the, the introduction of the fixed point photography, which is the um, the monitoring system that we've implemented in Lone Hill and Vetcop and Dam. Basically, this system is assisting us to track the densities, the efficacy of the activities in the dam, and also because we've released the biological control, it's important after releasing those um, in the agents to be able to track how effective they are on the control of that particular receiving uh, species. So we also have the water testing um, happening, um, which we're trying to assess what are the changes in the water quality as compared to the densities in the dam. And our hypothesis is well when we started with the fixed point photography and the release of biocontrol is that the biocontrol might not be effective because of the water quality of the dam. But for us to be able to prove that, we, we also have to understand what are the changes of water, of water quality in the dam. So both the fixed point photography and the water quality testing is happening monthly, um, a week after the other. And we recently released about 700 uh, crypo, Crytobogus uh, sylvinier, which is basically the snout beetle for um, uh, cariba weed in both dams. And this was done in partnership with the DEF and uh, the Rhodes uh, University. So we are now in the process of trying to um, uh, assess Test the efficacy uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the beetles. However, when we came back from uh, the, the lockdown, uh, we observed some overwhelming densities at Lone Hill Dam. Basically, it was almost like wall-to-wall -wall densities that we observed. Um, and we thought this was because there was no intervention that was happening in the dam. And the approach that we, we actually took in trying to manage the problem was um, 
setting up the thresholds wherein the dam was divided into management blocks. And in partnership with the Loan Hill Ratepayers Rate Association, we got two, uh, a full team, uh, a full time team of two guys with the boat who were then uh, instructed to remove the caribou weed on the blocks where we, we, we identified. The reason why we did the block system there was one would know that if you clear caribou weed, because of the movement of the water, it actually uh, moves back to, to areas that you've cleared. So the blocking of it allowed the team to be able to focus on a certain block. Further to that, there's a block which we've left as a not to touch block because it is used as a, a sanctuary for our biological uh, control agents. The biological control agents were released in June 2020 and in, we also initiated the fixed point photography during that period as well. Um, and what came out of that process was between July uh, 13 and 17, we had about uh, 1.5 wheelbarrows that were taken out of the dam. Between uh, July 20 and 24, we had about 2,300 wheelbarrows that were taken out of the dam of caribou weed. And between 30, uh, 28 and 30 July, we had about 1,960 um, wheelbarrows that were taken out of the dam. And the uh, image on the, on the left can actually show that there were also some recognizable um, uh, changes in the dam as well. Because somewhere in August, uh, the densities dropped uh, tremendously. And however, um, it took us about two weeks to remove the material because this is a used park um, that the, the public is using. So the stuff that we were taking out of the dam was packed on the edges which then required to move it uh, elsewhere. However, on contrasting uh, uh, scenarios, in Vetkopen, we don't have a full-time team. However, we're using our own contractors, the, the contractors that we're using for operations. Yes, there were biological agents released. Yes, there was fixed point uh, being released there as well. There was an intervention that happened in August. And I would like us to look at the, the following images to look at the changes between the two systems. Um, looking at the one where there was a full-time team and looking at the one where there was um, a, a once-off uh, team. And they are basically <coughs> clearing changes in the, in the condition of the dam. Um, this one, the first slide is basically for Lone Hill Dam. Um, the, the image on the, on the left was taken in July 21. Same spots, uh, uh, the other image was taken in August um, uh, 2020. You can see basically the, the condition and the densities in the dam already are dropping. This is where the full-time team is located. S same dam, um, another fixed point area. On the left, an image taken in July. On the right, an image that was taken in August. Uh, again, there's a full-time team that is based here. Uh, these are preliminary results for Vetkopen, where we're using our internal contractors. Um, the image on the left was taken in July, and the one on the right was taken in August. Um, you can clearly see the difference between the two areas as well. Another image of this dam um, taken in July and the other one taken in August. And you can tell that the, the density seems to be increasing. Um, the reason why the one in August is showing the sign of uh, a certain uh, open water body is because the condition was that uh, we took the photo in on a windy day. So it was pushing the, the caribou weed to one area of the dam. But even that can clearly show you um, that actually the densities uh, seem to be increasing. So basically what the, the two scenarios uh, told us was there's a need for a focused approach when clearing invasive species. Where resources are available, um, you, it will be better to have a full-time team that is focusing on that particular water body. Um, and it is also important to note that the results are long-term when it comes to controlling the invasive species. 
uh, you don't get the results immediately. Um, that is why most people would say that the methods that we are using, specifically the biological control, people would say it's not working, but it's a long-term process. Um, and also, we also found out that instead of focusing on the species, it's also important to consider there is a growing need to ground truth and map before work is undertaken. Um, that is to be able to identify the species that one is going to deal with. Number two, to be able to plan properly in terms of resources which are going to be used. Uh, and lastly, it is important to note to the public specifically that we need not to release exotic species into the wild. Even if you have not confirmed whether it is, it is invasive or not, uh, rather consult, then an official from either the municipality or the national department can come and help you identify the species and advise you accordingly. And thank you.